My name is Dorothea, and I am an AP Environmental Science student at Half Moon Bay High School. I'm interested in learning about our environment because we all live in it, and I like to know what's going on around me. Hello, my name is Maisie Eliashoff, and I'm an Environmental Science student at Half Moon Bay High. Um, I'm studying Environmental Science because I spend a lot of time outdoors, and I really want to learn more about the environment and how best to protect it. My name is Eric Dubois. I'm an AP Environmental Science student at Happen Bay High School, and I'm interested in studying the environment because I love the outdoors, especially the beaches and forests here on the coast. And it's important to know how we can protect the environment and the plants and animals as humans continue to impact the world. Today I'm in my backyard, which is sure to have a lot of insects. And I would like to present Dr. Stephanie Dole, an entomologist who has studied insects all over the world. And today she'll be teaching us all about the insects that live right here on the coast. I hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie, or Dr. Dole, or Beetle Lady, and I am an entomologist here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm coming at you, to you from my uh, home office here in San Mateo, where I live with a bunch of wonderful live bugs. And what I do for a living is I'm an educator and I teach people about insects and spiders and all sorts of other wonderful terrestrial arthropods, especially the ones that we have here in our area. So I want to talk to you today about all different bugs that you're going to find and what different bugs um, are out there. And normally in my classes, you might be able to touch and meet some of the bugs, and I'm sorry we won't be able to do that today, but I'm going to bring some live bugs to you right here from my office for you to meet. What I've done as an entomologist is my specialty is to look for new kinds of insects. So I have studied tropical bark beetles. These are little tiny beetles that get into trees and sometimes they're pests. And I've gone to places like Ecuador in this photo and have collected and studied new kinds of beetles and written about them and taught other scientists about them. But right now, what I do most of the time, well, before the pandemic hit, was I go to schools and libraries, and maybe some of you have even seen me at a school or a library. This is at the Half Moon Bay old library before they remodeled. Um, so I do these programs, and I bring my live bugs, and I teach about all things, including even bugs of Pokemon. So some of you may not like bugs on their own, but maybe you like Pokemon. And if you like Pokemon, you probably know there's a lot of bugs in Pokemon. So we're gonna talk about going out in the world, trying to catch them all or observe them all. And I'm gonna use, these are my, some of my favorite live bugs and I'm gonna show some of these to you today so you can be able to recognize what you're seeing when you go out and explore in your backyard or on the coast at different parks and wild spaces. So as an entomologist, everything I study is an arthropod. And arthropod are animals that, the word arthropod actually means joint-footed. And that's because they have these kinds of joints on their bodies that they need to have in order to move with a hard exoskeleton on the outside. But the basic thing you need to know about all these animals is they have an exoskeleton. They have a hard shell on the outside of their body and they have no bones on the inside. So as an entomologist though, what I deal with is all the arthropods on land. Now you guys live near the ocean, so you might know that there's a lot of arthropods that live in the ocean, right? Crabs and shrimp and lobsters and things like that. But those are all dealt with by a marine biologist. If I wanted to study those, that's the area that I'd be in. So all the different kinds of arthropods, the ones that live today, we call these extant arthropods, are things like crustaceans and arachnids, a group called myriapods that I'll introduce you to in a moment, and insects. And this is a huge amount of the animals on our planet. This is 80% of all animals on our planet. So as an entomologist, my main specialty is insects. And an important thing to know is that all insects are arthropods, but not all arthropods are insects, right? So remember, we have things like tarantulas and crabs and lobsters and millipedes and centipedes that are arthropods, but that aren't insects. And even some of those, in an, as an entomologist, because they live on land, I will study them and I will teach about them. Here's another way to look at it. So this is one of my displays that I bring with me to classes. And we're seeing a lot of these right now. Maybe some of you have started to see these in the store, these skeletons of bugs. But these are really wrong. So over here in the corner, that's not a spider skeleton. No way. This is a spider skeleton. 
And this is actually a spider skeleton of a spider that I have alive right next to me in my office. They have to take their skeletons off when they grow. And you'll see there's some photos in the middle of this display that show that, that show one of these spiders. In fact, that's the very um, growth, that's the very molt that this skeleton came from. And that's not a butterfly skeleton. They don't have bones in their body. That's a butterfly skeleton. And you might think, but wait, hold on. That spider skeleton, it looks like a spider, but it's a little different. Um, but the butterfly skeleton looks just like a butterfly to me, right? And that's because when you look at a butterfly or you look at another insect, like this cicada, that's not a cicada skeleton, that's a cicada skeleton. When you look at them, what you're seeing first with your eyes is a skeleton, whether or not they're alive or dead. So that's a thing to remember about all these animals that they have in common. Their skeletons on the outside and they have to take it off when they grow and they don't have bones on the inside regardless of what sorts of fun Halloween decorations we find that show us that. So let's do a little quiz. Let's see what you guys know about these groups of animals. Which ones of these are crustaceans? Now crustaceans are a lot of things like lobsters and shrimp and crabs. So if you guessed this is a really interesting guy. This guy is a deep sea isopod. He's related to a roly-poly and they're huge and they live at the bottom of the ocean and they feed on things like whale skeletons. I kind of wish, or uh, whale carcasses. I kind of wish as an entomologist that I got to study these because I just think they're so cool, but I have to leave them to the marine biologists. And then the one crustacean that I will sometimes study as an entomologist and that I will teach about and that I'm going to show you now is the other one you might have guessed and that's this one. This is called a roly-poly, or um, sometimes people call it a pill bug or a potato bug, although that depends on where you grew up because some people call something else a potato bug. Um, so these are actually not insects. They're not very closely related. I mean, they're closely related to insects in that they're also arthropods, and some people think that they're the close, that uh, crustaceans are the closest relatives of insects, but they're pretty distant relatives as far as evolution. So let's meet some of these guys, because this is, I always call these, these are kind of the gateway bug. We all have stories. I grew up in Los Angeles in a really urban area where I didn't have a lot of open space to explore. And these were the bugs I played with first as a kid. They're just, they're everywhere, right? Um, so they're, remember, they're crustaceans that live on the land. They're one of the only crustaceans that entomologists deal with. And there are two basic types here. There's a lot of species, but the one on the top that's flat, that's called a wood louse. Or, or wood lice if you're talking about more than one, and they can't roll into that tight ball. And I see these most commonly around here, although they're both very common. And then the one under that is um, a roly-poly or a pill bug. Um, and these are the ones you will see around here. So I'm going to show you some of these live right now at my desk and teach you a few things about them. Here. Oh, here they are all scattering everywhere. Okay, let's zoom into these guys with my desk camera. So here are these roly polies or wood lice. These actually are all wood lice. Um, and you actually, do any of you see these smaller things that are next to them? Those are actually kind of an insect called a springtail and they're one of the smallest insects. They're so great and they're everywhere. You can always find them in moist soil. So they're another thing you might see around. Let me teach you one fun fact about these guys. So they have to be moist. So if you're gonna go looking for them, you have to turn over logs. You're not gonna find them in really super dry places. Um, and sometimes you'll see one that is a slightly different color than the others. And they kind of look kind of purplish. Here's one, um, lighter, oh, he's running away. Here he is, there he is. Do you see that purpley one? Here's a really cool thing. We're all stuck inside a lot lately because of this virus. These guys that are more purple colored actually have a special wood lice virus. And it's not a virus that hurts them very much. And actually you can tell by the fact that this guy's living with so many others, it's not terribly, terribly contagious. Um, they, it's just a common thing around here. Um, and I first learned about it from another entomologist friend because I wondered why am I finding all these purple wood lice everywhere. So they're a crustacean, but entomologists will deal with them. And I'm sure you guys have all seen these. So another group of arthropods that you guys might encounter are myriapods. And this is a name I don't expect any of you to have ever heard before. I don't think I knew this name until I started getting into entomology. Myriapods, I'll give you a hint, are, are arthropods on land that have the most legs of all. So these are things like centipedes, and millipedes. 
And there's a primary difference between centipedes and millipedes. They're kind of opposites of each other. Centipedes tend to be very flat. Um, they have two legs attached to every one of their body segments and their legs are kind of on the sides of their body. And centipedes are fast and they're predators and they can bite and they have venom. So a lot of centipedes we see around here are pretty small and they don't, um, they aren't very good at biting us because their, their jaws aren't big enough to get through our skin. Um, but still, centipedes are not always great to touch and they're not the best animals to teach with because they escape really easily. But our millipedes are the exact opposite. They um, have uh, more of a hot dog shaped body. They have four legs, so two pairs of legs for every body segment. And they um, are pretty harmless. They are decomposers. Think of them as earthworms with legs. Again, just like our roly polies, you're going to find them in moist places. And they love eating dead, rotting things like leaves and fruit and things that have fallen on the ground. One millipede you might see around here that looks a little like a centipede is this species. It's called the yellow spotted millipede. And I'm going to tell you, I told you, remember that the centipedes are venom, or the, yeah, that centipedes are venomous. Well, millipedes are poisonous. And it's a really important thing to know the difference. So something that's venomous can bite you. So like think of a honeybee as venomous or a snake as venomous. They have to bite you to inject that toxin into you. Um, things that are poisonous, you have to either eat them or lick them or touch them a lot for them to have any effect on you. And these guys are actually safe to touch. I just wouldn't ever lick your fingers after you touch them because they have a defense, which is cyanide. They smell like almonds. The chemical cyanide is one of the most toxic chemicals, and, but it smells like almonds. It actually smells really good if you like almonds. So if you find a millipede in the Bay Area that kind of looks like this, um, they smell like almonds. Another quick tip is if you happen to have a black light, you can shine that on them and they glow under a black light. So you may see some of these on the coast. The other most common kind of millipedes that you're going to see on the coast are these. These um, are, again, um, pretty harmless. They are poisonous. But again, remember that that means, and especially with these guys, you really, you'd have to eat one. And I'm not sure you could. And poisonous also does not mean deadly necessarily. Poisonous could simply mean it gives you a bad tummy ache and makes you bark. So they use a chemical called a benzoquinone, and it smells kind of like bacon, like not the best bacon. One kid once said to me, it smells like bake, dog bacon, like the bacon treats you'd give your dog. It's not yummy kind that you might eat, but the kind that you might feed your dog. So um, let me show you what these guys look like um, so you'll know how to recognize them. Okay, so here's a millipede. This is slightly bigger than most of the ones you're going to see around here. This is a species called the uh, gi American giant millipede. Um, so they're, they're one of the larger species, as you can see, compared to my hand here. Um, and they have lots and lots and lots of legs. Here's its little head up at this end. And they basically just crawl around like this. When they feel um, threatened, they'll curl up. Into a, into a little spiral, and then they might make that chemical. If I get that chemical on my fingers, it's bright yellow at first, the benzoquinone, but then it turns kind of purple and it'll stain my fingers kind of like, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten a henna tattoo, kind of like that. It will stain your skin and then it'll eventually wear off. So there's kind of, he's feeling a little relaxed, so he's not doing his full defensive things. He's not getting into a full, full spiral. But these guys are great. If you find them, you can touch them, you can hold them. I would just always, but just like with anything else, I would recommend washing your hands after you do, just because you have that, your hands might smell funny. In fact, sometimes my hands smell, smell funny for the rest of the day after I've been holding these guys. But they're harmless and they're really interesting to see. And they're another arthropod that isn't an insect, but that entomologists can study too. Let's meet some more. Now we're going to talk about arachnids. And for some people, these are some of the most exciting ones. So most kids will know right away, right, that a spider is an arachnid. So something like a tarantula. Tarantulas are just a family of large spiders. They're a particular group of spider. We sometimes don't call them true spiders because they're one particular branch. 
but then we call all the other spiders true spiders. So things like this adorable jumping spider. And we have a lot of these in the Bay Area too and on the coast. If you meet a spider and it looks at you, it like actually turns and looks at you, it's probably a jumping spider. They have some of the best vision of um, spiders. Other arachnids you may not realize are things like daddy long legs. And daddy long legs, maybe you've heard this, are actually not spiders, and that's true. They are a more primitive group. Um, spiders have two body segments, and you'll notice this daddy long legs has just kind of one main body in the middle. Um, and so they're just a primitive spider. It's a myth that they're extremely venomous. They're not, they're harmless, and they're really cool. Another arachnid you probably know about are scorpions. We do have some local scorpions here. No um, scorpions that we have in the Bay Area are what we call medically significant, which just means none of them are gonna send you to the hospital. They, they sting, every scorpion can sting, but our scorpions are not too bad. They're, they're not super harmful. Um, you have to go to places like Arizona to get ones that can wallop you a little more. And even then, they're usually not deadly unless the person's already sick for some reason. Um, and then this is our probably our least favorite arachnid, the tick, and that's a blood-sucking parasite that can sometimes give us diseases that you probably have to watch out for sometimes when you're on hikes, um, especially in grassy areas. So just know those are arachnids. They're related to spiders and things like that. Okay, so to tell an arachnid, I'm going to give you a quick body plan. This applies to all a lot of them, um, especially the spiders that I'm going to introduce you to, um, they have two body segments. So instead of three like an insect, they have this thing that's called a cephalothorax, which is like saying head thorax. Together, cephala means head. So it's like saying head thorax. Um, and basically, that's what it is. It's the head, it's the body, uh, the mouth parts, the eyes, and it's where all the legs are attached. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of the organs in it and that's what the abdomen does. The abdomen has all the organs in it. And arachnids have eight legs. You're going to count them on this picture and say, but wait, beetle lady, I see two short ones in front. What are those? Because that makes it ten. And those are actually palps. They're part of the mouth. And the reason that they have parts of their mouth that look so much like legs is that all insect and arachnid mouth parts evolved from legs. They used to be legs in their ancestors. So it's easy to have part of your mouth look like a leg when it originally came from a leg. Um, we have a species called the Bay Area Blonde, and this occurs throughout the Bay Area. You can see these, in, especially in the hilly areas of the coast. Um, the species name, entomologists are actually totally don't agree on what the species is. So a lot of people, you'll see this called a Fonapelma smithi, um, but some entomologists are, uh, think it's just the same as an, uh, one, another species that lives in, in the interior of, the, of North America, too, called Iotis. So they're all just one same species, but we just have a big population, um, population of, of them here in Northern California. Um, they're found inland, chaparral, and woodland habitats. So you won't find these on the beach, but you'll find them like I've seen these um, in the hills above the coast. Um, they spend most of their lives living in burrows, especially if they're girls. And the thing that we're seeing right now, some people call the tarantula migration, but it's actually just boy tarantulas looking for girls. Let me introduce you to one of these because I have one for you to meet right now. Okay, so this is Robin. Robin isn't totally full grown yet, so they can get quite a bit bigger than this. Afonapelma tarantulas, there's a whole bunch of different kinds. I see these all the time in Arizona and all over. There is a group of tarantulas, a genus of tarantulas that lives in North and South America and, and, and Central America too. They are known, here's the good news, they're known for being super docile and gentle. Do you notice how this tarantula is not running all over the place on my hand? Part of that is some of these spiders that I have are very used to being handled, although, you know, since I haven't been going out teaching lately um, in person, some of these um, aren't as used to being handled as they usually are. Um, and these are, they're very docile. Even if one did get startled, um, they are um, very, very, um, they're very, uh, their, their venom is very mild. They don't have a strong bite at all. In fact, that's not the primary defense of these Afonapelma tarantulas. Their primary defense is itchy hairs on their backside. So even mm -hmm. though 
Robin here is all fuzzy wuzzy and I might want to pet her and love on her and all that, I shouldn't do that because her itchy hairs can make my nose and eyes very red and itchy and watery and all of that. So um, that's my advice to you. You can see one of these tarantulas out in the wild. I would leave them alone if you see them out in the wild and certainly don't pet a tarantula, especially its furry bottom because that is basically, that's why I don't get bit by these, is that's not really their defense. Their bite is not bad at all. It's barely venomous, it's less than a bee sting, but their itchy hairs can make my nose and eyes itch um, for the rest of the day. But they stay on the body unless they kick them off, which they will sometimes do if they feel threatened. They'll kick those hairs at you. But, um, but Robin isn't doing that because Robin's a pretty, pretty chill person, or pretty chill tarantula. <laughs> All right. So lastly, we're going to talk about my special group, my favorite group as an entomologist, um, which are insects. Um, so insects are everywhere. This is one of the things I love about this and, and why I can give you a presentation about this. I can tell you about insects and you can go right outside and see them because they are everywhere. And I promise you, once you start training yourself to notice insects, you will see them everywhere. I go hiking with friends and sometimes they'll say to me like, how did you, I'll say, oh, look at this on this flower. And they'll say, how did you even notice that? And it's because my brain and eyes are trained to look for things like that and notice them. And once you do too, you'll have a lot of things to observe when you're out. Times where other people might say, oh, there are no animals out here today because they don't see a bird or a deer or things like that. Guess what? There's bugs everywhere always and you can check them out and they're really exciting to see. So which ones of these are insects? I bet a lot of you know this. A lot of us learn it in kindergarten. We learn it really early in life. There are things like dragonflies, ladybugs, wasps, and grasshoppers, right? And the thing that sets all insects apart, and again this is something we all learn usually in California, we learn it in second grade, that insects have three body parts. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. It's a little hard to see on this guy, but you can pretty much see the, the head part, the thorax, and the abdomen. He has six legs and two antennae. And you might say, wait, that's funny. Isn't it antennas? But antennae is actually, antenna is one of the words that to pluralize it, I add an E to the end instead of an S. So it's two antennae and four wings. But you can probably think of a whole bunch of insects that you see all the time that don't have wings, right? So if an insect does have wings, they have four wings or like flies have two wings, but their back pair of, pair of wings have evolved into something else. So we can see where they used to have that second pair of wings. So, but sometimes things like ants don't have wings. There's a lot of cockroaches that don't have wings. There's some beetles whose flying wings have, have stopped working and their front wings have sealed up into just a, an impermeable shell. Um, so, Sometimes that's the case. And they also have these special eyes that are called compound eyes that are really sophisticated and they're made out of lots and lots of lenses. And here's the cool thing about California insects. There are so many of them and we haven't found all of them. At this point, we have recorded 100,000, more than 100,000 insect species, different kinds of insects in California. And part of that is our state is just so diverse. There's so many habitats and ecosystems. And you can compare that to things like we have 223 mammals in California and 641 birds. So those are in the hundreds, insects are in the hundreds of thousands, which is why I can't tell you today all the different insects that you can possibly see. I can just give you a quick sampling of some of the highlights of what you might see when you go out today. And there are insects that you could show me and I could not tell you what they are. I'd have to look up or talk to one of my friends who's an expert in that group because there are just too many of them for one person to know. Here's one group I see a lot when I go hiking on the coast. These are called predaceous ground beetles. They're in a family called carabids. And this group has 40,000 species in the world, 2,700 in North America alone. And these are very active. If you see a really fast beetle, I'll see these running really fast across a hiking path. Um, they're active predators. These guys are like little tigers or little lions running around looking for other bugs to catch and munch. So they don't just sit and wait for something to come to them. They run around and search for them. 
Um, they're often found either under logs. So again, if you're turning over logs, which is again, maybe you're getting the hint that that's a great thing to do when you're looking for bugs. But here's a tip about turning over logs. If you turn over a log, you always put it back the way you found it because it's an important habitat. And if you turn it over and leave everything under it exposed to the sun, you've destroyed a habitat for a lot of different critters, not just insects. So be sure to roll the blog back over and roll it over carefully and slowly so you don't squish anybody. Um, so these guys, um, you can see this is kind of a, a, I get technical here, but they're identified by something that's called a trochanter, which is shaped like a football. They have this like extra piece that that red arrow is um, pointing at on their back um, leg that other beetles don't have. That's like you can tell them right away if you flip them over and look for that. Another family that you're going to see, and I'm going to show you a live uh, specimen of this, is maybe you guys have seen these. Some people call them stink beetles or skunk beetles. Again, there's, these have 20,000 species in the world, and we have 447 species in California. And these guys have a chemical defense, and they also pretend to be dead. They also make really great insect pets. So often when parents say, well, my kid really wants to keep a bug as a pet, this is one of my favorites to say because they're really easy to take care of and they live a long time. They can live like 10 years or more. Um, let's, go, let's go look at one of these live. All right, here's my buddy. Oh, he's gonna do it right away for us. Let's get a good view of him. Let's see. Here he is doing his death feigning thing or his, his stinking thing. So this is a this is one of these tenebrionid or darkling beetles that you might see in the area. They stick their butt end up and they make these chemicals that um, again, they're really similar to those millipede chemicals. They're like a benzoquinone, they smell kind of funny. Some of these guys have stripes on them, some of them don't, some of them are rough, some of them are smooth. This is one of the bigger species that you'll see out here. These guys you can go ahead and touch if you see them. Just be careful, wash your hands after you touch them. But these guys, I've never ever encountered a tenebrionid that has nipped me or anything like that. Um, they just have that, they know they have that stinky smell and they taste horrible. In fact, things like birds leave them alone because of that. So these are a great uh, beetle. And now if you go and you see one out on a hike, you'll be able to say, I know that's a darkling beetle or a tenebrionid um, beetle. So they're a great, great local beetle to see. Okay, I want to show you just a few more. Okay, this is one of my favorites. In fact, I have a friend who lives in Half Moon Bay who just sent me a picture of one of these this week and said, what on earth is this beetle? And they have the coolest name. They're called the Devil's Coach Horse Beetle. And it, they don't quite look like a beetle. You might think, oh, they look like an earwig or something like that. And that's because they're in a group called the Staphylinid beetles. And the Staphylinid beetles are also called rove beetles. And just like those carabid beetles, they run around on the ground and hunt other bugs. These guys I see a lot, a lot. I teach a high school class. And when we go out collecting, we catch, always see a bunch of these. Um, so these are, actually native to Europe and North Africa, but they were introduced to North America. So they are not a native species here, but there are a lot of them and you will commonly encounter them. Um, here's the thing about them. They have this, you, you'll often find two of them together. And in that case, they're a male and female pair. And if you um, bother them, you'll notice they'll stick these two little white things that are circled here out of their back ends of their abdomen. And they make a little bit of a chemical odor defense, although I never find their smell to be anywhere near as strong as the other beetles. So you see a theme here, chemical defenses are really popular in insects. These guys can give a good bite. Um, I almost call it a pinch because to me, it, it, I, they rarely um, draw blood. They just give a good bite, but only if you restrain them. So that's another big beetle lady insect um, tip. If you're ever touching a bug or holding a bug, if you just let it walk on you, it's going to be fine. I can hold these if I let them walk on me, but as soon as I put a finger down and restrain them and keep them from being able to move, that's when they pinch. So um, good idea to, to not touch things you're not sure about, but um, these guys are definitely a neat, neat insect that you can see. 
I'm just going to flip through a couple other common ones that you might see. I see a lot of these soldier beetles, especially in the springtime. Um, these guys come out in large numbers, and these are one of our local pollinating beetles. They poll so you'll see them around flowers a lot. Um, they're a really great group of beetles, and um, they're really distinctive. You'll see them with that black and that red um, coloration. This is another really cool beetle that you'll see around here. Uh, it's called a cobalt milkweed beetle. They like to be on milkweed plants. I've seen these in places like San Pedro Valley, Valley Park in Pacifica. They're really beautiful. They look like they should almost belong in the tropics. Um, fiery skippers are also all over the place around here. A skipper is like a butterfly, but it's smaller and it's actually its own little separate group. Um, so skippers are a little bit different from butterflies and you will see them around um, this area a lot. They're, they're a little bit smaller. And one of our big local bumblebees that you'll see is these big yellow-faced bumblebees. You'll see them um, and other species of bombus bumblebees um, buzzing about the flowers on the coast. And finally, um, this sulfur-winged grasshopper, you'll often see these grasshoppers, or maybe you won't see them because as you can see, they have fantastic camouflage um, when camouflaged against things like the rocky coast or um, sand and things like that. I don't see these too often right on the beach, but I do see them like in the areas around near the beach, like where the little, you know, streams are running down the coast and things like that. And when they um, fly, they make a little noise and they flash these beautiful sulfur wings. So I hope you guys um, learn a lot today. I hope you can recognize some local insects. If you find something and you can get a good picture of it, you can always go to my website, beetlelady.com. Send me a message. Uh, my website actually doesn't let you send me pictures directly from it because internet stuff, right? So, but if you send me a message, then I'll reply back and then we'll be emailing each other and you can send me photos of what you see and what you find. Um, and, and I can let you know about what you found. Um, another tip is to use iNaturalist, which is an app that lets you track the animals that you see. And it's not just for insects. In fact, it works really fantastic for birds and mammals and other things that are a lot more easy to identify than insects. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about what you find, you're always welcome to contact me through beetlelady.com. So you guys are going to be led by some of the high school students on making a project. And this project is something, I love the name for this. This is, so if you bought one of these, if you bought the tool that this is based on from an entomology supply store, it would be called an aspirator. That's a really boring name. So um, what this is, it, it's called, we call it a pooter. That's what entomologists all call it. We never call it an aspirator. We call it a pooter, P-O-O-T-E-R, pooter. And we will actually say things like, did you poot that bug? Or can you poot that bug? Or is that bug pootable? And a bug is pootable if I can suck it up with my pooter. So that means it has to be small enough to fit through this straw. So I wouldn't be able to poot some of the things I showed you today, because I showed you some pretty big bugs. But most bugs aren't that big. So you'll learn how to make this. It uses a salsa cup, two straws, and a piece of mesh material. And that's really important, because that's going to keep you from sucking the bug up in your mouth. And here's my pro tip on the pooter. When you make yours, after you've done it, put something, you see how I have this orange tape here on the part of my pooter that I'm gonna put my mouth on? That's the part with the screen. Because when I see a really cool bug, I get really excited and I wanna go for that bug and I don't have time to think about which end of my pooter is which and examine it. I wanna just be able to poot up that bug and catch it in my pooter. And when you do that, it ends up in this little chamber and these salsa cups are great for observing and watching your bug. And then to let them go, you just open it up and shake it out and your bug is free. So that's another great thing you can do with insects. You can do a lot of catch and release observation. You can nature journal about them like Jack Laws told you about. Um, you can do all sorts of things and they're always there for you to explore and examine. So thank you very much for joining me today and get out and explore your coast. Thank you, Dr. Dole. Today, after this presentation, we'll be making a bug pooter, which is a safe and humane way to collect and look at bugs. Uh, so for this activity, you will need a portion cup, two flex straws, clear plastic wrap, filter material such as cheesecloth, nylon stocking, gauze, etc., a single hole punch, scissors, 
tape, a pen or a pencil, and optionally a magnifying glass and practice materials such as grain of rice. The first step to making our bug pooter is punching two holes in the portion cups, one on each side. So we're going to punch our first hole. And across from it, we're going to punch the second hole. All right, now that we have our holes punched, we're going to take the mouth end of one of our straws and insert it into the cup. Mine fits perfectly, but if it doesn't fit perfectly and you need it a little bigger, use your pen or your pencil and try to widen the hole. If your hole is a little bit too big, then use tape to wrap around it. Our next step is to wrap our fin filter material around our straw. If we need, um, if you have a thinner filter material, you might want to do a couple of layers, but mine's pretty thick, so I'm just going to use one. And we want air to pass through, but not uh, your insects or whatever you're going to be catching in your bug pooter. Um, so now we're going to stick it into our hole. I had to do it the other way around for this one because it was too thick to fit through. Okay, the next step is to cut out the outer rim of our lid. So I'm just going to punch a little hole in here to make it easier to start cutting. And then I'm just going to cut around leaving the edges but cutting out the middle. The next step is to stretch your plastic wrap or your plastic bag on top of your bug pooter and try to make it as tight as possible and then put on your lid. This way we'll be able to observe the bugs that we catch in our bug pooter. So this is our finished bug pooter, ready to catch some insects and observe them. So to use our bug pooter, we're gonna put our straw with no filter up against our insect that we're trying to catch. Um, I used a little piece of rice just to demonstrate. And then we're gonna sharply inhale through the straw that has the filter. All right, and now we have our little piece of rice in our bug pooter and we can observe it. And then when we're done observing, we can let it go by opening the top.